Mr. Speaker, as the Clerk of the House received a communication from the State Board of Elections regarding a vacancy in the 46th House of Delegates District. He advises me that he has. Mr. Speaker, could the Clerk report that communication? Uh, I don't think it's an order. What we do while we set aside the process we have in place, we leave the people in the House District 46 without representation on the floor of the House of Delegates. Is that not true? I would say that is true, and I feel very badly that that's the case. Mr. Speaker, this is day two that the citizens of House District 46 are unrepresented here at the Capitol. Today is day six that the people of the 46th House of Delegates District are not represented here on the floor of the House of Delegates. This is the seventh day that the citizens of the 46th House of Delegates District have been unrepresented in this body. We're delighted to have the gentlewoman from Alexandria with us, and only wonder what took you so long. <laughs> Would you be allowed to attend that birthday party in your own house because that person has given you money? I mean, the way this is drafted, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously asking you the question. Uh, without objection, by for the day. Is, is that what you said you want to go by for the day? Um, I know what I'm talking about. Mr. Speaker, I put in House Bill 2652 three weeks ago on behalf of Mr. Joanna and my, myself. That particular bill was in privileges and elections, and I kept calling and asking when I might get heard. Three weeks has passed, and it wasn't heard. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon. We get uh, always get more bills than we can possibly spend uh, time hearing. Oh, we don't have time to hear these bills. What do you think the people sent us down here to do? Mr. Speaker, for the second time in two years, a small group of members from the majority party in subcommittee have killed a either a bipartisan or a nonpartisan bill sub dealing with redistricting. The heart of the bill is all about governance. It's about members of both parties being willing to work together to address the issues that are facing our commonwealth. I would not have done this had there been a vote and the members lost. You do not treat the parents of handicapped Virginia children with silence. I said to the committee, it is not morally acceptable, and it is not. Clerk will close the roll. Ayes 32, no 63. Ayes 32, no 63. The motion is not agreed to. Darwin, however, is best known for the theory of evolution, arguing that men are not only, quote, are, are only not not created, but they are not equal as more, as some are more evolved. If we take this tax money and use it for transportation or this fee, whatever you want to call it, would not we be, in fact, relying upon the porno industry to build roads in Virginia? Mr. Speaker, I'd answer the gentleman saying I think that's a spurious argument. I, I would think that people were, you know, paying those taxes on watching Pocahontas and, and uh, you know, X-Men. I know people are entitled to say and do what they want on this floor and in committee, but at some level, I guess it's not unreasonable to ask for a little bit of consistency. Well, I appreciate the gentleman's comments on consistency and um, his lecture on consistency. Next time, I'm sure I'll be lectured on comedy with colleagues. Hey, what I'm never calling Hogan. This is the fourth time that we've had resolutions um, pulled from blocks because, uh, presumably, because they um, recognize um, gay and lesbian groups for their participation in the. Um, social and political fabric of Virginia. I think uh, here we are in the 21st century that um, when groups who we may not um, personally feel comfortable with uh, do great work, uh, I think as a courtesy, uh, it's worth commending them. Shall the resolution be adopted? May you favor that motion I'll say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. You know, Mr. Speaker, it was only a matter of time, I suppose, before we heard on the floor of this House what an abomination this stimulus plan is coming out of Washington. It's terrible spending. It's not going to do any good. It's the worst thing we've seen in a long, long time. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? When it comes time to spend the money, I'll venture to guess when that little conference report on the budget comes back, I bet there's going to be a little stimulus money in there to spread around. It's kind of like two brothers go out and buy a young calf. I don't know how you can say 
I really don't like what they're doing in D.C., but I'm going to accept the money and be consistent. When that calf's about 11 months old, one brother comes back to the other brother. They've had this fatty calf. He says, guess what, brother? I killed our calf. We're going to party tonight. The plan provides little evidence that it will actually stimulate the economy. You did what? You killed my calf? You killed our calf? Well, yeah. But it will, it'll be great. But it puzzles me a little bit, Mr. Speaker, how it is that we stand up and say, well, I'm going to vote for this budget, but I don't like that stimulus money. Well, if you don't like the stimulus money, it appears to me the vote would be no. No on the budget. But by golly, I'm getting my half of the calf. I cannot refuse the money from D.C. It would be foolish when the check arrives to say, no, thank you, give my money to California. They're bankrupt and we're not. That would be foolish. And when it comes to economic stimulus, I think that all the ideas that have come from the other side of the aisle would fill a thimble. We can be pleased that President Obama and members of the Congress were willing to stand up and say these are tough times and that we need to be able to respond. So, Mr. Speaker, we can all disagree about such things as a stimulus package. If we don't do something, nothing's going to happen.